inviting me to come to speak to you on this very important subject of the necessity of Christian education. It's been at least a 50-year pilgrimage for me. Uh, we homeschooled our own children because uh, there was a lack of interest in uh, uh, a Christian school at that time. <coughs> pleased to say that my grandchildren are receiving a Christian education uh, at present, and that's so encouraging. But it has just been pointed out, uh, I thought the situation was rather dire uh, 50 years ago, and I think we all know that it has deteriorated significantly in the last 10 years in particular but it was deteriorating before that. So with those few, few words of introduction, uh, the title of this address is The Necessity of Christian Education. We're looking at three principles. Principle one, that Christian education is necessary to preserve our parental authority and performance of our duty bringing up the next generation. Principle two, Christian education is necessary to remedy secular departures from biblical truth in the school curriculum. Principle three, Christian education is necessary to help to maintain the unique features of biblical truth in society. I will endeavor to be able to cover these three principles uh, today. Now we get our ethical and spiritual moorings from that passage which is read to us in Ephesians 6 and 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now three uh, obvious affirmations are involved in this. One, this is a natural duty. Two, this is a Christian parent's duty. And three, this is a two-sided duty. First of all, Christian education is a natural duty. What do I mean by that? Well, this exhortation is relevant to all parents, especially Christian parents. The father-child relationship applies to all fathers, whether Jews, Muslims, secularists, or others. Each father has the duty of bringing up his children in the knowledge of the true God. And without the knowledge of Christ, no one can fulfill this duty properly. The Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Christians are not looking for some special privilege. All children should receive a God-centered and God-honoring education and be brought up in the knowledge of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The triune God of the Bible is the only true God and the Jesus Christ of Calvary is the only true Savior. Many might think this is an outrageous proposition that I bring, but it has been the ostensible foundation of state education throughout my lifetime since the 1944 Education Act. My primary and secondary learning was under the reorganization arising from this groundbreaking legislation that ensured I would have a state-controlled education which was ostensibly Christian, not by chance, but because many of the schools taken over already had Christian origins, a society for propagation of Christian knowledge schools. So it was no new thing. At the time that I was in secondary school, Morning assembly was attended by staff and pupils. The assembly consisted of a hymn, scripture reading, prayer, and I would call it thought for the day. 
So our state education has its foundations in the concept of Christian education. The education act 1944 had expressly provided for a state system of Christian education. The secularists had lost the battle at that time and as H.C. Barnard says in his a history of Christian, uh, sorry, a history of English education from 1760, he wrote that the 1944 Act, I quote, laid down that in every county and voluntary school religious instruction should be given, and that the school day should begin with an act of collective worship, though of course the right of withdrawal and conscientious grounds was safeguarded. This was the first time in our educational history that religious instruction and school prayers have been specifically enforced by Act of Parliament, and it affords striking evidence for our national unwillingness to add secular to the formula universal, compulsory, and gratuitous, end of quote. The 19th century English radicals and liberals had been contending for secular as opposed to Christian education, but were not successful. Now, less than a century later, their goal is becoming public policy in our multiracial society. So we are not the extremists. We are actually the conservatives in connection with this matter. Now, Christian education as the Christian parent's duty. Paul addresses fathers as the ones ultimately responsible for their own children's education. This does not exclude mothers, but fixes responsibility on fathers as the head of the house. We fathers can be a responsibility for what our own children are taught, and we will be held to account at the final judgment for our stewardship in this connection. It brings in this matter of in loco parentis and Christian parents. At this present time, our British system of education still acknowledges that the teacher is in the place of the parents. It is on this principle that parents have a right to withdraw their own children from certain lessons. And it is in violation of this principle that parents have not been given the right recently to withdraw their older children from certain sex education classes. Certainly the principle of in loco parentis is under serious attack at this time and there are those who would deplete parental authority to suit their own agendas. One example is in connection with relationships and sex education. The Christian Legal Center has produced a very useful paper entitled Four Things Parents Should Know About the New Education Law. From September next year, all primary schools must teach relationships education and all secondary schools must teach relationships and sex education. The Christian Legal Center paper advises as follows. Mark the distinction between what schools must do and what schools should do, because the guidance goes beyond the statutory requirements. Note the scope of the instruction, the nature of marriage and civil partnership, and their importance for family life and the bringing up of children, safety in forming and maintaining relationships, the characteristics of healthy relationships, and how relationships may affect physical and mental health and well-being. The paper goes on to say, remember that any material presented to pupils must be age appropriate and must have regard for the religious background of the pupils. Of particular relevance is the fact that any other items mentioned in the guidance 
like the teaching of gender identity, is wholly ultra-virus and therefore not strictly binding on schools. In such cases, schools can depart from the guidance if they have weighty reasons for doing so, such as maintaining the integrity of the ethos of a Christian school. End of quote. The governing body is required to consult with parents concerning their policies and to provide examples of materials to be used, but there is no parental right to withdraw children from relationships education, even though this conflicts with the Human Rights Act 1998. Now, two conclusions of the Christian Concern paper are as follows. I quote, firstly, precisely stated, if material is being presented to your child that is not age appropriate or fails to take into account your Christian faith, you have a statutory right to object. If the material is being presented to your child, whether in relationships, education, or RSE, is being done in a manner which lacks objectivity, is not critical, and does not reflect a pluralism of views under the Human Rights Act 1998, you have a right to withdraw your child from that portion of the lesson. Second, Christian schools have a right to teach relationships, education, and RSE in a manner consistent with their ethos. Paragraph 21 of the guidance, for example, states that schools are free to teach these materials from a faith perspective. Similarly, in advice to the Department for Education issued on the equality duty owed by schools, they made clear that it is not the government's intention to undermine the ethos of any faith school. I would therefore suggest that now more than ever we need strong Christian schools. End of quote. An occasion where we might thump the pulpit <laughs> in order to emphasize that fact. Now relationships and sex education are the two areas where conflict arises between secular views and those of Christians. The divergence between secular education and what Christian parents should want for their children now affects swathes of the curriculum. The grave departures from biblical moral standards and the principle of in loco parentis are strong arguments for alternative educational provision. Be it Christian home education, which is not practical for everyone, Christian parent cooperatives, which have proved successful for some, or Christian schools, some of which have been extremely successful. What is clear is that lessons on sex, marriage, and procreation from a secular standpoint that contradict scripture cannot be accepted as meeting the scriptural requirements in Ephesians 6 and 4. Such deviations from the biblical standards are sinful. Sinful. Now Christian education has a two-sided duty. We are informed not only what to do, but also what not to do. So what not to do, we must avoid provo provoking our children. Ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath. We are not to provoke by over severe or misplaced discipline. There are very few parents who think that their children should conform to their standards. Those of us older folk are familiar with the saying, children should be seen and not heard. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ not wanting to converse with a child? Conversation is a two-way thing. So we must be on guard against the suppression of youthful personality by over severity in discipline. But we must discipline. We must discipline in love, with restraint. But we cannot support smacking bands for 
A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, 15. We are not to provoke by failure to safeguard. Bullying by peer groups or older children is a widespread serious problem. A young Christian I know, now attending sixth form college, is a changed person in being able to communicate with others. Five years of secondary school bullying that he kept silent about is now over. There is even the even more sinister provocation of allowing our children to be subjected to ongoing intellectual bullying mm -hmm. by their peers or teachers mm -hmm. for failing to comply with secular views of origins, morality, or marriage. Some adult Christians are feeling bullied in the workplace and elsewhere over issues such as this. Now on the positive side, we must nurture up our children. Paul will not leave the matter of the nurture of our children with advice on what not to do. There is a very fruitful and positive side to education. But, he writes, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the law. What does this involve? Christian education is the answer. The well-known 19th century American Presbyterian Professor Charles Hodge explains, I quote, as Christianity is the only true religion and God in Christ the only true God, the only possible means of profitable education is the nurture and admonition of the law. That is, the whole process of instruction and discipline must be that which he prescribes and which he administers, so that his authority should be brought into constant and immediate contact with the mind, heart, and conscience of the child. If we take seriously Hodge's words there, the only possible means of profitable education and the whole process of instruction and discipline, we must be committed to the necessity of Christian education, and to this end, Christian schools and colleges. Section two, Christian education is necessary to remedy secular departures from biblical truth in the school curriculum. As our parental duty regarding our own children is to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it follows that we should be vigilant concerning all that they are taught. The question should be ever before us. Is this consistent with what the Bible teaches about truth, creation, human relationships, and so on? Let us consider some key issues that underline why we need Christian teaching and Christian schools. First of all, authority. As I explained earlier, education in the 1950s was ostensibly Christian. Morning assembly was praise, prayer, scripture reading, and thought for the day, followed by any school notices. In our religious knowledge classes, the Bible was the main textbook. I distinctly remember our tact task of drawing the synagogue at Capernaum. On holiday in Israel a few years ago I saw the ruin, the lower, lower dark stone level uh, on which a light stone replacement was built is considered to be the old foundation of the synagogue in which our Lord taught. But all was not well in our scripture classes. Reference to archaeology was used not only to confirm biblical details, but also to undermine the authority of scripture. Our archaeomaster master was a grape sediment and sandbank man. Despite the pots being referred to as water pots for purification, we were taught that Jesus did not turn water into wine, but grape sediment mixed with the water the servants poured in. And here, Preston, 
There was a kind of instant wine instead of instant coffee. When Jesus supposedly walked on the waves, according to their view, we were taught it was because he was on a sandbank that the disciples could not see. Can you imagine the eternal Son of God made in a sandbank? But there it is. That was the kind of teaching that we had undermining the authority of Scripture and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So each week, our state schools, while ostensibly Christian, even then, were undermining the authority of Scripture. Sixty years on, they have become promoters of ecumenism, multi-faith worship, and syncretism, whereby all roads are viewed as leading to God, despite the teaching that there is one only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Now subject two, science. Point one, the role of science. The celebrity scientist Professor Brian Cox states in his human universe that, I quote, it is not the role of science to prove or disprove the existence of God. With this, we can agree. We take it as a given that God is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Cox states more fully, the goal of science is to explain the observed features of the natural world. By explain, I mean build theories that make predictions that are in accord with observations. This is a humble idea, and there is no a priori aim to discover the reason for the existence of our universe or to build theories of everything. Would that Richard Dawkins and company accepted that science can only be a description of what is and not a final proof of impersonal origination. Psalm 19 affirms, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The Apostle Paul explains, Romans 1.20, that the invisible things of him are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Where is that in the school curriculum these days, dear friends? Point two, signs and origins. According to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, Genesis, but it clearly teaches that, I quote, the work of creation is God's making all things of nothing by the word of his power in the space of six days and all very good. Now, even in my childhood, science teachers regarded this biblical doctrine as naive. Many want to maintain that science has proved that God does not exist. The humanistic argument is that evolution proves that God does not exist. Well, this is a falsehood that is not sustained by proper science, though accepted by MP school heads and science teachers, thankfully not all of them, but nevertheless, the majority. My amateur interest in astronomy led me to one honest assessment of the evolutionary hypothesis as not accounting for the origin of the universe. Patrick Moore, in his Atlas of the Universe, gives the honest assessment that even accepting the evolutionary hypothesis, which he does, it does not explain origins. He states, we can work back to 10, negative 43, an unimaginable number of a second after the Big Bang. But before that, all our ordinary laws of physics break down and we have to confess that our ignorance is complete. In any case, we are not really talking about the origin of the universe at all. We are discussing its evolution, which is by no means the same thing. We must credit Moore 100% for accuracy on that point. There is no spontaneous generation of matter, however far back we might go. Mm. There is no eternity of matter, however far back or forwards we go. Yet there are amazing evidences of design mm. that can't be rationally accounted for by impersonal 
horses. Now, I make no claim to be a scientist because it is not my background. I have a friend who is a PhD in a science discipline, and we can both see and agree that evolution is hypothetical, not proven science, <laughs> and that there are many scientific and geological counterindications. I have recently read Andrew Snelling's uh, sequel to the Genesis Flood, a two-volume work, uh, which is almost 1,500 pages, entitled Earth's Catastrophic Past, Geology, Creation, and the Flood. And you should read it if you have not done so already. It is a good job in bringing the creationist apologetic up to date. We need to be stirred to indignation at the way in which our children are being taken in by an evolutionary hypothesis that has so many holes in it. So next week, the family. Now the family unit is the foundation of society. We look backwards to our grandparents. Well, some of those other grandparents now. But we look backwards to our grandparents and parents who preceded us, forwards to children and children's children who follow us, and around to brothers, sisters, and other relatives of the same generation as ourselves. We cannot deny that families are the bedrock of society. The old secular, secular communism did not work and collapsed with the Berlin Wall in my lifetime. We can only address this subject of the family in a summary way that is in no way indicative of its fundamental importance. This is true of each of our responses to secular divisions. But I will make three observations concerning marriage as the bedrock of society. Observation one. Marriage between one man and one woman is God's exclusive institution. Secularism denies both the divine institution and the biblical definition of marriage. Concerning the latter, the Westminster Confession of the Faith, followed by the Savoy Declaration of the Congregationists, 1658 and the Baptist Confession, 1689, states, marriage is to be between one man and one woman. Now it is lawful for any man to have more than one wife, nor any woman to have more than one husband at the same time. Marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife, for the increase of mankind, with a legitimate issue, and for preventing of uncleanness. Those words are exactly the same in those three Protestant traditions. Amen. Presbyterian, Congregational, Baptists. We are all standing together Amen. on this issue. Now observation two, state education has now embarked upon a program of indoctrination that seeks to undermine the biblical teaching on marriage, sexual relations, and procreation. Specifically, one, it contradicts marriage as being exclusively between one man and one woman and affirms that it may be between two women or two men. Two, it contradicts the permanence of marriage by regarding divorce as being subject to the will of either one of the parties. Whereas the only biblical grounds for divorce are for the innocent party where the other spouse is committed to adultery or, in the case of one party's irredeemable desertion. <laughs> Observation three. State education con contradicts the biblical teaching on sexual relations. Scripture is clear that sexual relations have no place outside of marriage, that they are to be confined to intercourse between a man and his female bride, and that any other relationships lie under the judgment as impure. Mm -hmm. Not that we're seeking to cause any unnecessary offence. We must state what is the biblical position. Mm -hmm. Because we are Christians, because we believe mm -hmm. in the Bible as the inspired word of God. Mm -hmm. Subject three. Constitution and law, very briefly on this one. Democratic majority does not endow any party with absolute moral authority. Our UK heritage is not one that bestows upon its legislature to make moral law. 
might be MPs mm. and point that out mm. because they seem to have no concept that that is the case. The underlying assumption is that our lawmakers will legislate within the recognized model law, mm. which according to our constitution is still the law of God expressed in scripture. Her Majesty the Queen, you know, received a copy mm. of the Holy Bible at her coronation. Now subject five, business studies, economics and commerce. So I can speak with some authority on this subject having been a college lecturer in business studies and thereafter a university lecturer in accountancy, corporate responsibility and debt counselling. You can read the fruits of my analysis in the book Stewardship Ethics in Debt Management, but you'll probably have to go into, into debt if you want to, uh, want to buy it because unfortunately <laughs> it's priced at over 100 pounds at present by the international publisher in public business ethics. Now, this book is based upon a rigorous analysis of the stewardship concept that you find in scripture, applied to borrowing and lending. In my university lectures, I applied the stewardship concept to corporate management, and I found that the module went down well with my postgraduate MA students. I think that the emphasis and practical outworkings of such as vocation, responsibility, fairness, and development resonated with them as modifiers of an exclusive profit motivation. Let's not think that all of the young people of the land, even if they are not churchgoers, are against positions for which we stand. We can be pleasantly surprised sometimes in, in terms of what they can recognize in the biblical position. Conclusions on this section. I would emphasize at this point the relevance of Biblical subject matter to our contemporary society, which has hopelessly lost its way. Had we been more diligent over the last 50 years about Christian education, we would not be in a position where Christian concern is having to run special courses for Christian graduates to give them a Christian perspective on economics, politics, sociology, sociology and so on. It is a good thing that they are doing that, mm. but it bears witness to the neglect of Christians in general since 1944 to affirm and practice the relevance of the Bible in detail to the educational curriculum in primary, junior, secondary, and university education. Now, section three. Christian education is necessary to help them attain the unique features of biblical truth in society. Affirmation one. Christian education aims at a truly good life as defined in the inspired word of God. That's what we aim at in Christian education. We read in Proverbs 4 the bold and challenging words, hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to your understanding. For I give you good doctrine, Forsake ye not my law, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and to live. Uh, of course, we tremendously thankful to God that our four children have grown up in the faith, professed the Lord, and are seeking to live seeing my grandchildren being brought up in the same way. You can see, dear friends, how affirmative these words are. Atheists are very dogmatic about their views, but not with the same justification as Christians. We are persuaded that we can proceed with the education of the young on a firm basis. Observe these three presuppositions of this verse in Proverbs. From the Bible, as the word of God written, Believers are in possession of a universally valid knowledge which has to do with moral absolutes and an unchangeable reality. Second, believers are able to communicate this knowledge to those under their instruction, even as they learn it under similar nurture. Three, 
with respect to this body of knowledge, attention, retention, and action on the part of the instruction will involve the good life, which does exist and can be experienced. Now, contemporary relativism and the current anti-authoritarian mood reject all three of these propositions, but God's covenant people are obliged to face up to them regarding the education of their children. We must define the good life, state what is involved in it, and identify those facts which are of the greatest significance in connection with it. This will provide the irreducible core of our educational program, furnishing a solid foundation. Affirmation two. Christian education imparts objective truth. Christian education proceeds on the basis of the accessibility of universal valid knowledge. It does not regard everything as merely relative. It maintains that there are moral absolutes and an unchangeable reality. There is an accurate body of knowledge to be transmitted to following generations, and it is an inestimable privilege to be involved in its communication. It is, however, a weighty and solemn responsibility to teach others because what is taught must be true. As Professor John Murray explains, I quote, we think very superficially and naively if we suppose that no wrong is entailed in purveying this representation of fact, even when persons are, as we say, the innocent victims of misinformation, we are not to suppose that they are relieved of all wrong. What we need to appreciate is that the representation is false. It does not accord with truth. Such a representation ought not to be. It is a violation of truth, and in the final analysis of misrepresentation of God's truth, it has affinity with the original. Consequently, to be agent of passing on that misrepresentation, however noble may be our motive and designs, and however deeply unaware of its untruth, must entail for us in some way or other involvement in the intrinsic wrong of the untruth. Professor John Murray, Principles of Conduct, you will find that very useful in terms of the Christian position in connection with ethical standards. Now this means that a Christian parent or teacher has the onus responsibility of testing that body of knowledge which he transmits in order to eliminate or expose all falsehood error, and distortion. In order to do this, the Christian educator requires some ultimate reference point by which to assess what is accurate and to identify what is untrue. The final reference point for this must be God himself. He is the absolute, eternal, and unchanging truth, the God that cannot lie, to Titus 1 and 2. Now everything else has a dependent and derived existence and can only be rightly interpreted in relationship to God as creator of all things. It is God who has given everything meaning and to endeavor to understand anything without reference to him is sinful. Put human reason or anything else in this ultimate position is to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 1 and 25. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, is the one only living and true God. All of the facts of the universe reveal him. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Psalm 19. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God. It is consequently inevitable that any interpretation of these facts, which is a contradiction of that which God is, must be false and is to be rejected. Affirmation Christian education is based on authoritative revelation. This consideration introduces a question. How are we to know God as he is and all things in relationship to him as their creator so that we might communicate truth? Certainly, 
not by seeking to read God's book of nature and history unaided. By virtue of his fallen condition, man is predisposed to misinterpret. By suppression of the truth, he holds the truth in unrighteousness and becomes vain in his imagination. According to, to Calvin, it is this condition of mankind that underlines the necessity of Holy Scripture. But as the aged or those whose sight is defective, he says, when any book, however fair, is set before them, though they perceive that there is something written, are scarcely able to make out two consecutive words, but when aided by glasses begin to read distinctly, so scripture, gathering together the impressions of deity, which till then lay confused in their minds, disappears the darkness and shows us the true God clear. According to the Westminster Confession of Faith, the scriptures were given for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world. And it's consequently a denial of the authority of the scriptures not to bring the scriptures to bear on every human enterprise. We categorically deny to humanism any monopoly regarding knowledge. The Bible is our ultimate authority. And it is just because the Bible is the word of God that the Bible is an utterly reliable guide concerning what is perfectly consistent with the character of God. In short, what is true. In consequence, no part of the day school curriculum can be free from the scrutiny of scripture. Mm -hmm. This is not to say that we use the Bible as a textbook of science, but it does mean that no scientific theory will be accepted as valid which contradicts the word of God. Similarly, any interpretation of history, which is regards the fall of man, and the consequent sinfulness and corruption in the life of the human race, will be rejected. The same may be said in connection with sociology, psychology, or anthropology. Now, there's nothing obs obscurantist about this approach, which is the only honest approach for the Christian. It is only by the discipline of bringing everything to the touchstone of Scripture that man can be delivered from the degradation and unprofitableness of an intellect contaminated by sin. Did not save you see? If ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now some may accuse us of putting a constraint upon the pursuit of truth, but Paul explains in Colossians that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Without him, man's intellectual attainments are stunted, eventually misdirected, and without ultimate Thus Ecclesiastes says, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This saw travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. You see, Christian educators need a regenerate mind. I'll not seek to explore that in uh, detail on this occasion, but affirmation five, Christian education has a unique end in view. It's a great mistake to view education as merely intellectual. The ability of a pupil to regurgitate facts at the, at the appropriate times, whether in essay or examination, is no evidence that the educational enterprise has been successful. Christian parents and teachers are to provide an education for life, and life involves more than the mind. We cannot live a life merely by knowing what is true. To live the good life, we must love truth and live by it. And this involves our affections and our will. A truly Christian education is aimed not only at the head, but at the heart. It is intellectual, moral, and spiritual. 
let me draw this to a conclusion. We will conclude with several foundations for education to be embraced by Christian parents, teachers, pastors and helpers, as well as the students. You remember the transformation of Europe that resulted from the posting of Martin Luther's 95 Theses on the door of the Church of Wittenberg. Well, the manifesto that I set before you concerning Christian education must be more modest, or I fear that you will not bear with me, or indeed not remember any of what I have said. So I confine myself to several summary assertions concerning Christian education. Assertion one, children and children's children are not ours to do as we like with them, or as an atheistic state dictates concerning them, but are to be brought up in the nursery and admonition of the law. The primary responsibility of this rest with the parents, though this does not require them to do everything themselves without delegation to responsible teachers. Assertion two, the exclusive foundation for interpreting all facts and undergirding all God-honoring education is the Bible, as being the word of God written, given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Assertion three, our universe can only be properly interpreted when it is recognized as God's creation, revealing his wisdom, power, and goodness. Christians have no quarrel with the scientific enterprise or the scientific method in itself. So this can be used by Christians and atheists alike. Christians must, however, be vigilant, as there is much smoke and mirrors clouding the issues these days. Now, session four. The educational enterprise falls short of its highest possible aspiration if it leaves its students without the true philosophy of life. It is only by knowing Jesus Christ as the Savior from sin and seeing in him the ultimate purpose and meaning of the whole universe that the realization of the individual's potential as the image of God can be achieved in service to him. Session 5. Knowledge is not an end in itself but is a means to attain man's chief end, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. How different this is from the bland, temporal, and impersonal philosophy of life or humanism, as Cox puts it, to value life with all your heart, to use it wisely, and to enjoy it while you can. Noble in some respect, no doubt, but falling so far short of man's chief end. The philosophies of our day leave people without hope or future. I put it to you, is that what we want for our children and our children's children? Surely not. For this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who now has sent words from the wisest and ultimate teacher, our Lord and Savior.